Welcome everyone to Color Commentary. We are your popper commentators, Michael Petrick and Adrian Gonzalez. How's it going, Adrian? Oh, you know, good. All right. So, so we've got we've got, we've got the upkeep this week. We gotta, you know, talk about the week past. You know what's going on with us as human beings, not just disembodied voices on the internet who you are listening to. Uh, how's your life going? Living large, living. It's been it's been good. It's been good. I uh, had a good week week at work. Uh, kind of weird that we're recording on Friday, but you know, um, I don't know. It's nice. I, I feel very relaxed right now. It's good. Yeah. Uh, full disclosure: my wife got a little sick yesterday, and uh, you know, family comes slightly before podcast. So, th- th- and it also worked out well because you had stuff to do, and otherwise we would have had you know cramped timing, and I just worked out nicely, and thankfully our patreons are very forgiving about us having a slightly flexible schedule um yeah thanks patrons you're the best you are um i'm getting to cube this week um i've got the abomination the sticker cube geared up and ready to go uh one of my coworkers is having a bunch of his friends over who i don't know and i'm going to subject them to what i think is you know fun so that'll be interesting well, you enjoy yourself. Got any got anything going on that we need to know about in the magic world? Uh, no, not really. Um, I've been watching a lot of legacy videos. Thanks, Channel Fireball. Ooh, anything in particular? You've been watching uh, Andrea Mangucci's stuff. Oh, you know it. Also, Caleb Durward had a Topless Miracles video playlist that was pretty cool. Um, I saw uh, that. I it, stay away. It looked sweet. And I, I tend to stay away from limited videos unless they are cube or a reprint set, like an older set. Um, but I did watch Reed Duke draft an and, he, and, you know, it's it's always fun watching him play. So, yeah, Reed, Reed, Reed's good people. Um, I, I've been I have also been watching a bunch of Andrea and Gucci stuff and I do I do love his content and I just I just wish he, you know, people would give him less hell for not having the most perfect English pronunciation because he yeah, always I like think that is it's I it's think that's so rude. It's rude, but at the same time, like I I, I don't want to you know come off as you know l- l- little bit of a pair of jerks, but you know we've we've both made fun of American content producers who shall go unnamed who might you know not have perfect pronunciation. I mean, let he was not sin cast the first stone, I suppose. <laughs> but no, I uh, definitely, if you're into legacy, check out Andrea Mangucci's stuff. It's really awesome. And he plays a lot of weird decks. I think this he week he played like everything. What was it? He Slivers? Was like oh, he played Silvers and he has, his most recent one is Eldrazi. Oh, yeah, did he? Played he Slivers pretty recently, too. Okay. I, I haven't actually seen the Eldrazi one. I guess I know what I'm doing after the podcast. Oh, yeah. I love, that's my legacy deck right there. Yeah, he did Nick Fit a couple weeks ago, and that's mine. So I really want him to do. I think he's done lands. That's the one I really like to to watch as a good lands player. Yeah, you just don't have that. Uh, don't have that. Uh, Tabernacle, the Pendrel Veil money, do you? No, they're real expensive. Yeah. All right. Well, we've talked about our personal lives. Uh, this is a deck tech that you actually picked out, and I'm gonna let you take lead on this and. Uh, do you want to explain what the hell we are talking about this week? Yeah, of course. Uh, Imperial Synthesizer, Wall Vito, Ben. You're all the same person, and you have submitted us a blue-green combo deck, and it is spicy. I won't read your whole email, Imperial, Wall Vito, whatever your real name is, Um but I totally remember you, so don't worry about that because you mentioned that in the email, and I thought that was funny. Like I, I, I don't know. I thought it was funny. Um, yeah, we would love to, to do this. So um, you, you do stress that it's not a competitive deck, but what I really like is not only did you submit it to us, but you actually have an excellent write-up over on the Reddit. Um, anyone who's interested in seeing uh, his take on this, please go check that out. It's a very well-written primer. He has videos. He has you know matchups. It's really great, and it's, it's going to go in a lot more detail than we're really going to go into on this show. Um, so thank you for the submission. Let's get into you. Blue Green Arcane Splice, more popularly known as Pedal Festival. <laughs> Are you ready, Mike? I am. I don't care for that name All either. Right. So but um, I, I know you don't. Yeah, it's um, th- this is this is a deck that 
I have it's, tried it's good out freed from the real. Is it is it good? Is it better freed from the real, or is it just? I think so. Okay. Let's get into the list and we can talk about opinions and all that afterwards. So so much like Freed from the Real, the goal of the deck is to build up lots of mana on one turn and then Kerbix torch your opponent. Um, so it, it's it's in that same vein of like generating a lot of mana. However, instead of doing it with Freed from the Real and a bunch of defenders, you know, for an infinite mana combo that way, and then you know, maybe you capsize your whole your opponent's board until you can actually draw the torch. Uh, this deck relies on arcane. Um, spells which were instants that were from the Kamigawa block. Um, and you could splice things onto them, which is uh, kind of cool, um, which I, I've also sorceries as well. And that's not so important in this deck, but it is interesting because it's the only instant tribe because it does count for, or no, I guess tribal does too, right, Mike? Uh, um, so so, so um, arcane is a subtype. And the way that the splice mechanic works, and I actually think the splice mechanic is really, really neat, but it's super confusing. So there's cards with splice onto arcane, and there are arcane cards. And what you can do is, with one of these cards that says splice onto arcane, it'll have a splice cost. You pay the splice cost when you cast an arcane spell, and then you add the effect of the spliced thing onto the spell so, so you it's, don't actually spend two spells you get to re-spend one spell yeah and you, you reveal it from your hand and it goes back to your hand so as long as you keep having arcane spells to cast you can get a re- repeatable effect out of it so and there's a lot of them um first up our first one is not this brainstorm uh blue for you know draw three cards put two cards on from your hand onto up to your library in any order uh we've had tons of conversations about brainstorm everyone um, I think knows our feelings on it. Basically, we don't think it's as good as it is in Legacy because, you know, the fetch lands come and play tapped. Uh, however, we are, you know, this is a combo deck. There are a bunch of fetches. Uh, I think Brainstorm is a defensible card in this deck. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I, I think, you know, normally Brainstorm feels bad, but here, just the fact that you're getting to look at three and probably put two back into the deck and shuffle them away is really useful in this sort of scenario. Yeah, exactly. Um, up next, we have our first instant arcane, peer through depths. One in the blue. Look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal an instant or sorcery card from among them and put them into your hand. Put the rest of the bottom of your library in any order. Uh, this is what was. I don't know if it still is played in scape shift decks in modern. I don't know if they still play it because I don't, I don't play a lot of modern anymore. Uh, but this is a way to dig. This is a great way to dig for the combo pieces. And I think you'll find that a lot of the cards in this deck are uh, dig cards, setting up, trying to set up for that big turn. Yeah, and this is a really weird riff on, uh, what is it, uh, Impulse. Um, and, you know, the Arcane thing is important to this deck in order for it to actually combo off. But I don't know. I'm kind of shocked that I don't see Peer Through Depth show up anywhere else else in popper it feels like one of those effects that i would have seen at least in some other janky combo list yeah uh it's, it's a good card if, if your deck is all instance and sorceries um but i guess it's just not as strong as like teachings in the teachings deck like why would you play this over teachings if you're already playing a, a teaching style control like, you know what i mean like the value you, off of teachings is just so much higher and if you really need more copies of a teaching style effect, most players would opt for, you know, a couple of copies of Forbidden Alchemy over this just for the reuse of it. Right. But the first, the, the next one is our um, first splice onto Arcane. It's called Psychic Puppetry. It is one in the blue for an instant, tap or untap, target permanent, splice into Arcane blue. So this is um, a pretty big part of the deck, actually. Uh, this helps us have big mana turns and you can also use it defensively to tap out your opponent before you go off so if you peer through depths at the end of your turn you can supply psychic puppetry onto it tap all of their um or you know tap a land you know and hopefully they don't have uu up for you to combo during your turn yeah um so th- and and this is kind of w- without this card you kind of can't go off um and th- to to be clear, though, that just means you can't go infinite. You can still win the game because, you know, this deck is trying to make a lot of mana and it can still kind of accomplish that. But this is part of the actual infinite loop and it's it's a neat card, neat little design. 
Uh, our next card is another instant arcane, reach through mists, you for draw card. And Mike, do you want to tell the lovely audience at home why you might want to use this over uh, maybe a think twice or a um, any of the other you draw card effects? Well, it literally is just the fact that it happens to have arcane as a subtype. Uh, that, that That's actually <laughs> exactly. pretty much it. Yeah, I mean, that makes it you know way more valuable on this deck. Um, up next, we have Sift Through Sands, another instant arcane, one U, U. Draw two cards, then discard a card, and then a bunch of irrelevant text that I'll read anyway. Uh, if you cast a spell named Peer Through Depths and a spell named Reach Through Mists this turn, you may search your library for a card named the Unspeakable, which is a rare, put it onto the battlefield, and shuffle your library. So this was part of a you know big setup thing in the Kamigawa block, and the Unspeakable was... I want to say a spirit horror. Yeah, it's, it's some huge gigantic creature and kind of the 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 idea is and I know that this was kind of a limited archetype from what I've heard. I'm I have not like heavily drafted the Kamigawa format as a whole. Um but you kind of had this this version that um ver, I've seen other versions of the splice deck that run um that run what is it dampen thought that mills your opponent for four and has splice. And apparently this was like a combo deck in this format that you could assemble in limited, which is pretty cool. So I will, I will read the unspeakable, which is triple blue and then six and nine total mana for a six, seven. Whenever the unspeakable deals combat damage to a player, you may return target arcane card from your graveyard to your hand and it is flying and trample. So, Okay, that, that was that card. That, that that's a pretty solid finisher, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, big big old big old blue fatty with with upside. Yeah, um, but um, but but sift is basically just, you know, draw two and discard a card. Um, yeah. Now here's a question: Do would we rather have that over like another copy of Reach Through Mist and another Brainstorm? Um, well, it is an arcane, which is an upside for us, right? Like that's, that's a thing that we just discussed as being true thing. Um, oh, you know what? I just realized you can technically use this to help make a brainstorm better. Oh yeah. It does have a free shuffle attached to it. And I'm sure that that's a niche thing, but that is, Oh yeah, you can, yeah, you can ser- search and fail to find. Actually, I didn't even think of that. That's that's pretty sweet, Mike. So not totally irrelevant text. Okay, well th- that's interesting, but yeah, I, th- I think the the so, arcane thing is what makes it better than another copy so of Brainstorm. Case, it's a three drop instant. Draw two cards and discard a card. You may shuffle your library if you've cast all the other ones. Yeah, that's okay. That's true. That does make it worse. But but I have played this deck, and the turns where you go off, you do tend to see a lot of cards. So I don't think that that's an impossible thing, just improbable. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the mana base next. There's only 18 lands in this deck, and a full seven of them are shuffle effects. Yeah. Um, if I'm going to critique anything about this, it's that. I think I think this deck needs more lands. That's fair. Um, I, I I don't really uh, you know we would have to ask uh, Imperial Synthesizer. Um, really, really. Um, what am I trying to say? He, he does go into some depth about why he cuts the lands, but I would I would be more I would be interested in seeing what number of games it's a problem in. You know what I'm trying to say. Like, like maybe since you're a combo deck, you really don't need it. Like maybe you're just trying to get to four and then you're going off and you're drawing a ton of cards. So, because the deck is like built around this combo, right? It's not like, you know, a deck where you have to hit your one drop, two drop, three drop, four drop. So I, I wonder if there is some reasoning behind it that is sound. Um, so, all right. So I, I'm, I'm looking at the list and, you know, I don't want to count stuff like Utopia Sprawl as a land, uh, not to skip too far ahead. But if you just look at the lands, 18 lands out of a 60-card 60, 60 deck, and you probably need at least two to get going, you're looking at a 68% chance of having two or more lands in your opener. Those are not odds that I dreadfully like. I don't like the idea that one out of every three hands I draw as, a, as you know my first as my seven. 
isn't going to have enough lands to get me there. All right. That, that's fair. Um, I hadn't gotten to the uh, enchantments yet, so I, I don't know. I just wasn't really thinking of them. But you're, you're right. We don't really want to count those because they cost mana and, and they can get blown up and that sucks. Yeah. I mean, do you want to get into those enchantments just so we can uh, get that out of the yeah, way because sure. I kind of spoiled it? Uh, let me just say the land real fast. One copy of Ash Barrens, four copies of Evolving Wild, seven forests because we have a lot of green spells, four islands, um, and two Chairmorphic Expanse. It is more important to have more forests because we are running... Um, a, 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 like like Mike's about to go into the enchantments, uh, all of them are green. So we really, really need to hit green mana in order to get started. And more specifically, I mentioned, uh, I'm going to get started in on these, uh, four copies of Utopia Sprawl. Utopia Sprawl is green, enchantment aura, enchant forest. As it comes into play, choose a color. Whenever enchanted forest is tapped for mana, its controller adds one mana of the chosen color to his or her mana pool this needs to have a forest in play. Otherwise it just does nothing. Right. Um, also all these cards are green. So yeah, uh, all these cards are green, but like Utopia Sprawl has the added kicker of even if you had like this deck doesn't run them, but if you had a blue green duel, this wouldn't work there either. Um, so we've got four copies of Utopia Sprawl. Then we've got four copies of Fertile Ground, which is one in a green enchant land. Whenever enchanted land is tapped for mana, it's controller adds one mana of any color to his or her mana pool. Um, and Dawn's Reflection, which is three and a green. And it does the same thing. So get two extra mana of any combination to his or her mana pool, to your mana pool. And then a copy of Wild Growth, which is green enchant land. When enchanted land is tapped for mana, its controller adds green to their mana pool. So it's just a Utopia Sprawl locked to green that doesn't accidentally get blown out by uh, Spreading Seas. Um. Right. So I've run this deck in the past and the versions I had seen always ran um, Simic Growth Chambers uh, to kind of compress the mana base down to fewer lands. And I think I prefer does this. address that. Yeah, I, because there, his, his reasoning is that, um, it, you know, he has a bunch of things. You got the mulligan if it's the only land in your hand. You can't really enchant it into turn three because it has to come down turn two at the earliest. You need multiple psychic puppetry to utilize the extra copies. And it is, it's dead when you're comboing. Yeah. Um, I think those are all super valid things. Um, I still am a little hesitant about 18 land. And I think that might be a little too low. But by relying on these enchantments instead of relying on the, uh, the, the crews, I think that that makes this deck stronger because it doesn't make... Like the big part of this deck is right. You need to get up to what is it? Six or eight mana before being produced by a single land before it combos out. We, you really, 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 really want to make sure that, you know, that land survives and having the crew lands just makes it that much more tempting for your opponent to blow them up if they can. Right. So um, moving into the, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, you want to take the sorceries? Yep. Moving to the sorceries, four copies, compulsive research, just an excellent, excellent card. If you're a combo deck, uh, two in a blue for a target player draws three cards. Then that player discards two cards unless they discard a land. So it's just, it's a digging spell. Yeah. Next up. Hoo, 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 hoo. We have ideas unbound. You, you for an arcane sorcery, draw three cards, discard three cards at the end of the turn. So when you go off, you actually don't care about the other, the second sentence on this because you're just right. going to kill them or you're going right. to lose. Right. And there's four copies of that. Two copies of Kirvik's Torch. This is our um, in game, you know, burning someone out with Kirvik's Torch, red X. As long as Kirvik's Torch is on the stack, spells that target it cost two more to cast. So, you know, some built in counterproof. Uh, Kirvik's Torch deals X damage to target creature or player. Yep. Um, you know, this is this is probably the best payload for this deck. Um, as I mentioned before, other versions have played Dampen Thought, which slowly mills your opponent out. Um, Kerevix Torch. Is faster. Yeah, it, it's faster, especially for Moto. Um, but the fact that it does have that little, you know, built-in counter protection does help you a little bit. Yeah. Uh, up next... 
we have, sorry, I minimized that for a second. Um, Pedals of Insight, the pedal part of the pedal festival. Although this deck, this deck's not running, what's they called? Market Festival? Um, it's not running Market Festival, but it is running uh, Dawn's Reflection, which is a similar effect. I think Market Festival makes it tap four two colors of any two, two mana of any two colors. Um, but yeah, it That's does great. not have the festival. Right. So it's it's more Petal Reflection would be the name of this deck. There you go. Um, and what and Petals of Insight, Sorcery, Arcane. Look at the top three cards of your library. You may put those cards on the bottom of your library in any order. If you do return Petals of Insight to its owner's hand, otherwise draw three cards. And, and oh blue. man, this is such a bizarre card. Like, Tell us it's, about it. It's just weird. Um, I really like it as a design, as a piece of design. But it's just like this is a weirdly designed card. Um, but this is this is how we go infinite because if you can if you have a land that can produce what five to cast this and then one to splice on a psychic puppetry and one extra so seven. If you can get to seven mana being produced by one land, this and a psychic puppetry just become infinite mana. And um, why is that? Um, because you pay because petals of insight returns to your hand. If you choose not to draw the three cards. Okay. Yeah. I knew there was, I knew there was a trick there. I, I knew it. I just needed you to explain everyone at home. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I got you. Okay. I got okay. you. I get, I'm, I'm okay. No, no, they get it now, Mike. Don't worry. They get it. They see. But yeah, so, so you're, you're looking for, you're looking to hit seven mana off one land and you can just go infinite with a petals of insight and coincidentally, you don't even need to have the Caravex Torch in your hand because you can just keep cycling through your deck until you find the three cards that have a Caravex Torch in them and eventually just cast Petals of Insight and draw the Caravex Torch. Right. So pretty sweet, infinite mana, all instant sorcery combo deck. Yep. Oh, and uh, we got four co- copies of Preordain in here. You know, the blue oh. scry to draw one. Yeah, just, you, yeah it's good. It's, it's a good cantrip. Um, okay. Sideboard. Sideboard. Two, one copy of Deep Analysis, uh, three and a blue, draw two cards. Target player draws two cards, excuse me. Flashback, one blue, pay three life. Um, then we've got three copies of Dispel, which is blue, instant, counter, target, instant. Um, one copy of Giga Drowse, blue, tap target permanent with replicate of blue so you can pay one blue to make a copy of it um you know manual and tap storm. down your opponent all your opponent's permanence yeah um notably their land so that they can interact with you um yep then we got glacial ray which is one in a red glacial ray deals two damage to target creature or player splice onto arcane one in a blue or one in a red sorry so so this is another infinite combo spout right like you could theoretically keep splicing this if, if, um, if you can get up to you eight splice, mana, you can splice can you as splice much as you want. Uh, what, what, what are we asking here? Split psychic puppetry? Can, can you can you infinitely splice things onto each other? No, you can't because one of them gets. You have to have something cast in order for it to get something spliced onto it. But but you could petals of insight, psychic puppetry, and glacial ray the petals. Yes, you could do that. Intriguing. Intriguing indeed. Um, three copies of Tangle, one in a green, uh, parental combat damage that will be dealt this turn. Uh, each attacking creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. Um, this is a hell of a fog. Um, turn aside, blue. Oh, this is interesting. Counter target spell that targets a permanent you control. That's actually a pretty solid counter spell in this deck. I like it. Yeah, because um, you got to protect the enchantments. Or more specifically, the land they're attached to. Um, oh, that too. Then we got Vital Surge, one in a green, instant arcane. You gain three life, and then it has splice onto arcane, one in a green. So technically, you can gain a whole bunch of life and uh, kind of keep yourself out of out of harm's way if, if need be with this thing. Um. So this deck, I have played this deck. I am not a huge combo player, but this felt incredibly rickety to me. Well, you're not a huge combo player, so yeah, yeah. And he, even he admits it's not it's not the best deck, but it's fun. 
I, I will tell you the handful of times I have actually won a game with this, it felt awesome. Like it, when it clicks, it certainly clicks, but oh my goodness, like you can get blown out so easily by things. Like I've been blown out by, you know, a main deck capsize or, you know, a counter spell. Um, I definitely think that this version improves on a lot of issues that the version I've played had, namely dampen thought is a much more mana intensive combo out. And this kind of, this kind of mitigates that a little bit. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think the land, the mana base is trimmed just a little more than I would personally like. Um, 18 land is very, very low. Not yeah, like it's not elves low, but like, I don't know that that sketches me out a lot. Cause like seven of those are fetches. That means you only actually have what 11 lands and no duels. So, you know, ideally you're hoping for two lands that can wind up producing different colors, I guess. Yeah. Um, but you're right. It's, it's, it's hard, you know, 68% of the time is not a lot of percent of the time. Yeah. Um, I will note that I think that this is probably one of the better places that you could play brainstorm. Um, besides the seven fetches, we've got the incidental, you might shuffle off sift through sands. Um, we've got compulsive research that can draw you back through those, uh, petals of insight. Once you start being able to once you get up to six mana, you can technically just loop Petals of Insight and um, uh, what is it? Uh, and Psychic Puppetry on one land and not generate any mana, but like set up a draw, I guess. Um, I don't know. Um, oh, and Peer Through Depths. Peer Through Depths, like if you, if you have three mana, you can just go Brainstorm and then Peer Through Depths and either get back one of the things you put back with brainstorm. If one of them was a good instant or sorcery or just dig into something else. Um, yeah. Chunky back card. I don't know. It's definitely, it is definitely an interesting deck and it is definitely like the purest combo deck. It there's like, it does nothing besides combo. And if it can't do that, it just loses. Any thoughts, Adrian? <sighs> yep. I don't know. I'm just thinking about how much worse it is than other combo decks. But, you know, it, I don't know. It, drawing cards is fun. Killing your opponents is fun. Like, I, it's fun. It's fun. So what combo deck would you recommend that isn't Affinity? Nothing. There's not really a combo deck right now. This is, I mean, this is pretty much, I, I like this deck a lot. I think it's better than the uh, Esper Familiar combo deck. Um, or at least I, I like it more in theory. <laughs> um um, you, you had mentioned, um, another, another combo deck that shares a lot of colors with this. Um, why do you think that this is better than freed from the real? Freed from the real involves creatures, which you can kill. Um, sorry, I'm umming a lot today. Uh, the reason I don't like, yeah, the reason I don't like it as much is just because the creatures are easier to kill. And this is a lot harder to interact with because I don't know, uh, what are you, what are you countering? Are you just sandbagging for petals? Like, is, um, that, is that what you counter? I feel like there's just so many good cards in this deck that eventually it's going to run the uh, control deck out of resources. Um, I think I think if you if I think if you try and counter every every enchantment that you can on the lands. OK, so 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 how many what, like what's the slimmest amount they can have left? Like they can get there on th on two Dawn's Reflection and two of the other ones. And there's 11. So if you can counter seven, if you can counter eight of their land enchantments, they're just done. And yes, I realize, you know, that's a little bit ludicrous to assume that, you know, you're going to have eight main deck counter spells that can deal with it. Um, but I think personally, if I'm on some sort of control deck, I either sandbag counters for the petals or sandbag them for the enchantments, specifically the Dawn's reflections, um, because those yeah. are the ones that are going to net you the most mana. And like I mentioned earlier, this deck is a little resistant to counter spells anyway, just because Kiravik's Torch, you know, that's not very good to counter. It's like a puppetry makes us that they have mana. What, what do you do if petals gets countered though? Can you still win? I guess you can. You could just 
you know, generate a ton of mana, draw a ton of cards. Well, so so one of the other ways you could win is just like reach through mist and peer through depths and sift through sands and then splicing on psychic puppetry onto something that generates more mana than what, three or four? And then just hoping that you don't brick ever. Hoping that you just keep hitting arcane spells and generating tiny bits of mana here and there. And if you brick, then I don't know what happens. You just lose. Yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah. Rickety. Not, not like the most rickety. This isn't, you know, your one land spy or anything like that, but it certainly does kind of have that issue. Um, the version I played also ran, I think it was four copies of moments piece across the main, main deck and board. And just to protect from the aggro, just to protect from the aggro. And I kind of think I'd prefer that over the tangle. Um, just because you get to pick when those get used. Whereas tangle is kind of, once your opponent sees it, they can kind of play around it by doing like the half attack where you'll yeah. feel bad blowing the tangle. But if you don't blow the tangle, you're still going to get hit for enough. Um, I definitely think this deck loses a little bit of stock now that, you know, Burning Tree Emissary aggro is flavor of the season. Like, yeah. like, like how, how does this deck come back from like turn to Burning Tree Emissary, Burning Tree Emissary, another thing? I think you would lose game one, but game two, we have, you know, we have, we have Glacial Ray, which is probably pretty good against them. We have Tangle, we have Vital Surge. So we do have tools. To, to beat those decks and then you, you sort of you weather the storm until you're able to combo um, and you can cut probably some of your slower draw spells like a compulsive research or ideas unbound. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely one of the more interesting decks. It was one of those ones where as soon as I heard about this deck, I did pick up pieces for it and then immediately was like, wow, I realize why I don't like playing combo decks. This is weird and uncomfortable and it doesn't feel right to me. Um, yeah. To say nothing like of the fact that a whole lot. what it feels like you're not doing a whole lot. Uh, yeah, that and, you know, as soon as someone figures out what you're doing, most of the time they'll be like, like, I feel this deck and freed from the real both suffer from the same issue of, you know, your opponent l almost definitely has a, a way to deal with your combo. And most of the time it's yeah. incidental. Like any any hate you have for boggles, pretty much, except for uh, standard bearer works against this deck. Um, anything that you know, I don't know. It, like just having counter spells in your main deck sometimes dooms this deck. I I feel like this is definitely one of those things where it's like it kind of gets accidentally hated out. Yeah, just because there's so many good sideboard cards in Popper, you're bound to run into something that's bad for your all-in combo. Yeah, that and you know, it's, I I've played this I played this deck enough times to find out that sometimes you just brick. Sometimes like your opponent has you dead on board, and you're like, I just need to hit something with this ideas unbound, and you can just miss nothing. <laughs> all right, where that tree is nothing all right so total cost for this thing in paper according to tapped out via way of tcg player as of time of recording it's 49 bucks um the online version card order is coming in at 33 um this deck is pretty much entirely no overlap with anything else and Ponder. You have ponder. Uh ponder or preordain. This is what I mean. Preordain. You have preordain. Uh and compulsive uh, research. Compulsive research. Caravix Torch. Caravix Torch is a spout for a lot of decks. If if you build this deck, you can build any of the big mana, go infinite mana combo decks. By that, I guess I mean this and um free from the real. Yeah. Um that said, thank you, Ben, for sending this in. It's a really cool deck, and I'm definitely glad that we got to feature it. Um, I just kind of wish that there was, you know, a combo deck in this format that actually could do well without being a problem for the format. Um, so, moving on. We've got some 
I've got some discussion topics. And the first thing I want to breach is um, kind of starts off not related to our format at all. Um, I was telling Adrian before the show. Uh, so Magic Online now is going to have uh, 1v1 EDH leagues. Um, and as a result, they had to create their own 1v1 ban list. And they wound up actually applying it to all Commander EDH games online. Um, the nerve. Yeah, people the are cheek. not happy. People are not happy about that decision. Um, I wouldn't be happy. But someone on someone on the Reddit uh, posted something about uh, the fact that they now, as a result, Commander has a different ban list online as in paper. And they argued for maybe this is a chip for popper players to get some recognition for the paper pool. And I'm just going to come out and say it. Stop using the paper pool, switch to the mit go pool, just be concurrent with online, make things easier for everyone. Desert is not healthy for the format. The other cards you're including aren't healthy for the format or they don't matter. That's, that's uncle Mike's PSA for the day. Uncle Mike. Yeah, crotchety old Uncle Mike who's had to sit through a work week and uh crazy old Maurice. What are what are you what are your hot takes on this? I, it's that sucks. Like that's C- Commander I, I I don't play a lot of Commander, but it feels to me a lot of the times that they make decisions about the meta game based on Sheldon Minery's personal play group instead of the format as a whole. Well, the the thing here is, this wasn't Sheldon. This was Wizards. I know. And so you said what they've done is they've made it a terrible ban list. So prime time is legal. Stuff is legal that wasn't, that shouldn't be legal. Stuff isn't legal that people are used to be playing with, like Soul Ring. And the format's a mess. It's a big old mess. Yeah. Um, you know, no, no bad blood with Sheldon or the rules committee, but... I definitely feel like, you know, having, and this is going to sound weird. I feel like I trust the secret clandestine ivory tower of wizards more than I trust the secret clandestine tower of Sheldon Menory and his play group. Um, yeah. So maybe, maybe it will be a good thing. Maybe these cards, I, like I said, I don't play commander. Maybe soul ring is that big of a problem. Um, I know that they recently changed the mulliganing rules for commander because of cards like soul ring. So well, so, so, just yeah, they in, add infinitum or whatever. Yeah, because they used to have what was it, the partial Paris, where your first mulligan you got to pick any chunk of your hand and put it back and draw that many cards. Yeah, now they get exiles, so you can't just try and sculpt the perfect skull ring. Soul ring oh no, 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 no! Now they have the Vancouver mulligan, just the 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 one that we have. Oh, the, I thought there was this thing where you like exiled your hand and then drew some nope. more and nope. They now they now use the the regular mulligan. Good. Good. Excellent. Um, but but my, my point here is I understand the desire for there to be like an official paper popper format. Um, and I'm just going to tell you, it's better to just use the MitGo pool and the MitGo ban list and call it a day. Um, I, it makes I, things a I, lot I easier. Yeah, we've we've had this discussion so many times, but yeah, Yeah. I I agree. And I get that you really want to try and influence change here. But at the same time, I'm just going to tell you (laughs) Wizards is just going to put up leagues and you can choose to play in them or not. And at the end of the day, you don't really make them that much money. So they're not really going to care that much. I hate to be like Debbie Downer Mike tonight. Yeah. Amazing, right? My God. Yeah. My God. and, and, you know, if, if you're not buying like sealed product, they, they really don't, don't have to cater to you. You're not part of their business model. My God, my God. The nerve. <laughs> um, um, yeah, that's, I, I wouldn't know how to take that as a popper player. Thanks for like it to be blissfully unaware because I don't play commander, but I would probably, I mean, I guess it's happened to us for so long, you know, now they're feeling our pain. <laughs> Now they're feeling our pain of, oh, wow, being a format that's on MitGo is weird. Um, honestly, I've also heard people like get really conspiratorial about it and say like, oh, yeah, Wizards just doesn't want to have to support multiplayer online anymore. So they're trying to make Commander as unpleasant as possible. And I'm like, uh, 
That's a little much. A little too tin, tin foil hatty for me. Yeah, you know we're 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 not we're not you know up in court talking about uh talking about our love of zebra meat here or anything. What? Oh, you you miss you missed that whole thing. I, I'll I'll tell you in in the post show. Um, oh. But um, our second topic for today is what what makes there there was a thread and I'm just gonna pull it up. Um, and this this is on the subreddit and it's entitled "Just a Thought About What Defines a Format." Um, I, so I was thinking a lot of, about all the posts I've seen about what you'd like downshifted, printed, or upgraded in Popper, and it got me wondering where does Popper end and when do the upgrades, downshifts, and intended power prints at Common push the format too far? I've played since before MitGo, and we would, from time to time, throw together fun decks out of leftover commons for a laugh. It was never that serious, though, not like today. And then it goes on for a little bit. So at what point, what, what's the power level that makes Popper no longer Popper? Um, I mean, I feel like I feel like this is, you know, Wizards is going to keep pushing the envelope and moving the goalpost. Really, it just comes down to how complicated the new age commons are. You know, we're never going to get an untapped fetch land, for instance. That's that's a rare ability to be able to fetch out a land and have it come into play untapped. Yeah. Um, I, it, 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 th- this is just like a really, really tricky question because it's hard to actually define where that, where that boundary is. Because honestly, if you'd asked me before Modern Masters 2017... I would have said that Burning Tree Emissary was too good. And, like, yes, it has warped the format, but, like, people aren't leaving like they were during Drake and that whole era. Yeah, but, but we had an equivalent for that card. You know, we had Frogmite, which doesn't generate mana, but is, you know, a, a free 2-2, so to speak. So I, I don't really know if that's equivalent. You know, Burning Tree Emissary, at the end of the day, is just a 2-2 creature. It's yeah. not, you know, a, a mechanic-defining card, which you get in the fetch lands where you... You know, you build your whole deck around these. They're in, yeah. They're integral. Yeah. I mean, I mean, fetch lands in especially like modern and, you know, especially in legacy, like um, my, my coworker, Ryan, uh, he, he, um, he's not super familiar with legacy. And every so often I'll just show him legacy deck lists and just be like, Hey, look at this, look at how silly this format is. And I'll send him like one of these deck lists. that's literally four colors and doesn't run any basics and it's just like oh yeah fetches and original duels just let you run absolutely goofy mana bases where you know it doesn't make sense like this deck is utterly absurd and that's not something we need in popper is it so i i feel like i feel like the format i feel like any format is largely defined by its mana in limited you know, what, what tap lands are available? What are my two color lands? What are other, is there an evolving wilds equivalent in this set and legacy and modern it's shocks and it's, it's shocks, uh, fetches, uh, you know, in legacy it's, it's true duels and fetches. And then in modern, you have these weird lands that you can't fetch, but are still useful because they come into play untapped and they tap for two different colors of mana. You know, the key thing, they come into play untapped. And then well, in proper, I mean, the I light mean, game lands. Yeah, I mean, even, like, the difference between, like, in Modern, there's Tron as the big colorless archetype, and then in Legacy, you've got uh, you've got 12 post, which, you know, goes even bigger, even faster. And those, those decks look remarkably different. There's also Mud, which also does a similar thing, and just, like, that looks nothing like Tron does. And then think of cards that are in Legacy but are not banned, or but are banned in Modern, Bloodbraid Elf. Two free spell, uh, a free spell, basically. Yeah, Deathrite Shaman, insane ramp in a deck that wants it the most, and you know all these other abilities tacked onto it. Like I think that's the power level where it stops becoming about commons, where you have these very complicated interactive creatures that do a whole bunch of things, or or even you know I guess there's even an opposite example. Take like Baneslayer Angel, it's just a five five flyer with life link protection and you know first strike or whatever. So if you stack a whole bunch of keywords on something, then it's outside of the popper power level. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a certain like amount of keyword soup that we could get away with. Like, you know, 
I would probably be okay with, uh, actually this is one of my, one of my favorite limited cards of all time. That's like not good enough for a majority of cubes, dark steel Sentinel. It is a, it is a six mana three, three vigilance flash indestructible, like something like that. Probably I'm, there's probably something I'm missing here. And it's probably the fact that it combos pretty decently as a finisher in, um, teachings, but I don't know, like I could see like some sort of keyword soup thing, but just not as pushed as something like Bane Slayer. Right. And then I will, I will also say formats change, you know, yeah. the format now versus what it used to be like, you know, format formats change the power level shifts. Um, think about, look at legacy, look at what just happened to legacy where they banned top that, that completely changed the face of the format. Like, within a week like we're, we're seeing weird stuff like uh what, what is it grixis delver is now the top deck um you know well, let's go for something a little bit even subtler the printing of leovold uh or you know throttled the shardless bug archetype because now all those decks are playing leovold because leovold is so much better yeah so j- the, deck, j- the deck shifts just being able to shut shut down your opponent's brainstorms and then make removing this thing a pain um, and, that, and that think, was enough. A really, a really big one about how formats change. Think of Elvish Vanguard. Elvish Vanguard was a rare when it was first printed, but as time has gone on and as power creep has happened and as more and more sets have come out, you know, that's an old card. Suddenly that card doesn't look so good, great as a rare. So they downshifted to a common to support an archetype in a limited format. So that's also what I mean by like power, power levels change. Like that, that card is not really a rare quality card anymore. It, maybe it would be uncommon in a standard set, but then elves would have to be hella pushed. Um, yeah. Like, like a lot of the old tribal cards were definitely thrown in at rare and could probably be printed in uncommon these days. Um, yeah. but you know, like there's certain effects I, that we I, still don't have. Yeah. I think there are some that are you know untouchable basically because of new world order on the cards. They don't want comments to be overly complicated. Uh, that's not to say all commons are weak. Certainly, there are still strong commons. They're just not as strong as some of the older ones that have been printed. Uh, but, you know, limited formats are also largely defined by their commons. So, you know, it, it is important to look there as well, I think. But, yeah, there, there are just some abilities that will never will never be a common. Like yeah. Fetches and typed duels. Yeah. Um, one of the things I'd like to see them make progress on is a real sweeper that is a little bit faster than even cars justice. I'm oh, looking oh, for, oh, excuse me. I, I we've talked about additional we, sweepers. That's not a common ability. Yeah. Like I, I don't want, I don't want a wrath effect. What I do want is I want an infest. I want actually just infest is fine with me or, you know, an instant speed hit everything for two damage for three. Um, even if it doesn't hit players, I just want some sort of effect that, you know, allows the slower control decks to kind of have a soft reset in the early game. I think pyroclasm is probably a little much. I know I've definitely mentioned that one before as something I'd like to see downshifted, but as time has passed, I think I really want something at the three drop slot Um, because it lets, you know, it lets stuff like blood braid, uh, not blood braid, burning tree emissary become the kind of thing where it can have those nutty hands but there is an equally strong answer. And I think that, I think that would be my fear is that wizards keeps escalating the quality of threats at common without, uh, without also escalating the quality of answers at common. Yeah. It's the, it's a tight rope. Basically what happens is they look at the limited set and then they decide. Yeah. And definitely you do not want sweepers at common. And that's kind of always going to be the issue, isn't it? Right. Like, um, what was it? Uh, in what was that other thing that even Cars Justice got printed in? Um, I think it got Tempest yeah, Remastered. Got Tempest Remastered, and sure enough, lo and behold, when I go to check that, yeah, it was an uncommon in Tempest Remastered. Um, yeah, that's too, and, it's, it's really strong. Yeah, I mean, part of that is the buyback, I'm sure. 
Um, a lot of the buyback spells at common got shifted up to uncommon when they did Tempest Remastered for good reason. I can't imagine a limited format with cap size at common actually being fun. Um, but I don't know. It's just, it's, it's hard because unless they ever do a product in the style of the commander products where they are allowed to kind of print something out of standard outside of the scope of a draft set. It's going to be real rough for us to ever get that sort of effect in my mind. Yeah. Um, that said, if I had to come up with like a short description of like what defines popper as a format is really just the fact that like popper is kind of a format of, very very specific types of mistakes if that makes any sense um yeah like a lot a lot of the stuff that we have in this format that is you know considered a staple is just kind of you know something Uh, that was pushed lightning bolt early cards that no one thought through or even more recent ones like delver where it's just like wow that's that's really really good or you know burning tree emissary Uh, treasure cruise was universally a mistake and i have a feeling that whatever like employee with an r&d originally like designed that they probably have one just like pinned above their desk with just like the word no underneath it it's a great card it's too good yeah it, it was it was deeply too good it was not a fun time at all um all right, we're 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 getting pretty close to an hour. Um, but you know, we've got our we got we got the fan favorite segment at the end of the show. Um, is it called Bros Bros Bros? It's called uh well, well we'll we'll, we'll wait and see how uh this week's edition of Main Deck Sideboard and Unplayable turns out. Um, MSU, the arch rivals of Tolarian Community College. Hoorah! <laughs> Um, this week I decided to give you a pretty decent reprieve from, you know, non human cards. Every one of these cards that I've picked out in this week's episode are in fact people. Are are they Mike? That's not what you told me earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I will admit on air on the public episode I did give my co-host a little bit of grief, but if you take your time, scroll down to the section of our show notes, walk us through your three options, and uh, oh. give us your frank assessment. No, I like this. I I can do this. First off, we have Gideon of the Trials. We see a stalwart man with the rocking chin strap looking proudly over as the sun rises in the distance battle ready handsome oiled by his many armor parts i don't know where i'm going with this one (laughs) um he's a a handsome long-haired guy he looks sort of like a guy that might live in california mike you know long boarding his days away on the beach as he dreams of being a model (laughs) okay okay up next we have garrick primal hunter a handsome hunk tattoos so he's kind of a kind of a bad boy. Um, he's not wearing a shirt. You know, he likes nature. He has some sort of pelt on his back with horns coming out of it. And does his armor really protect him? Is he or is his skin just you know? Um. So does canonic- he, or is, or is, does he have abs of steel? Canonically, Gar- Garrick is like eight or nine feet tall, and I think oh, so bullets can't hurt him. I, well, I. A, I, there, there are guns on a single plane in magic, and I'm pretty sure it's one of the ones that we can't go back to. Um, but B, I think he is supernaturally durable. Wait, which, which, which plane has guns on it? Um, one of the planes where Portal is set. Um, there are cards such as Aliborn Musketeers. It is the only reference to uh, firearms and magic. Interesting. Okay. Uh, underneath that, we have this total... Well, Mike, I can't say it on air, but he looks like a real creep. Um, his name is Jace memory of death. He's got some sort of anime spiky haircut. He's got something going on with his left hand. He's, he's really leering at me. I don't like this picture. He's just, he's scowling and he's looking my way. And I don't know if he, 
you know, I, I just, I don't like this. Um, so my main deck option is going to be Gideon. I'm actually going to go Nori Smith and then it's going to be Gideon, Garrick, and Jace as unplayable. All right. I, I, I can respect those choices, you know. Gideon Garrett, seems like the guy who um, would take me on a nice date. He'd take me on the nicest date. Yeah. Garrick, Garrick seems like, you know, a nice, nice walk in the park, but end of the day, you know, terrifying superhuman. And then, Maybe yeah. Maybe he doesn't eat meat, though. We could connect on that. Yeah, there you go. He probably doesn't. I mean, uh, I guess I guess Primal Hunter does indicate that he hunts beasts, but oh, every, yeah, we we wouldn't go along. But then every, Jace just looks he just looks like a huge jerk. The big thing I've always been confused about is like is does Garrick hunt animals or does he help them? Because all of his abilities are always like, oh, I can summon all these creatures around me. Or is he just like the laziest hunter and is just like, I've got magic powers. Come here, let me murder you. I don't know. He hunts to help them. All right. Well, you've chosen who's going to take you out on a date. How about you take us out of the show, Adrian? Thanks for joining us today. This podcast is brought to you by the support of our patrons. Please consider supporting us if you like the show. Check below this video or the description of this podcast for details on where to find us. We'd like to remind you that if you're listening to this on a platform with reviews, they're always appreciated as they boost our visibility. If you've got a deck list or an idea for a topic, feel free to contact us either via our website or by emailing us directly at colorcommentary at gmail.com. Patrons, we will, of course, get to yours first. So if you really want to get someone, uh, get something on the air, then you know what to do. Special thanks to Pat's Games and L. Until next week, this is Adrian and Mike, and we are signing off for Color Commentary.